everybody. My name is Andrew McConnell Stott, and I'm the USC Dornsife College Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Affairs. Welcome to our session. On March the 11th, 2020, USC went fully online, initially as a test of its remote learning capacity. The following week was spring break, during which the Mayor of Los Angeles issued a safer at home order. Students and faculty did not return to campus and instruction has remained online ever since. In the space of days, USC Dornsife College of Letters, Arts and Sciences moved more than 3,500 courses online. Initially, it would be fair to say that we responded in crisis mode, but very quickly it became clear that the online teaching experience was one that afforded opportunities for innovation and a space in which the mission of excellence in education could continue to move forward. To support the adjustment, we formed a community of practice around online learning that leveraged the wisdom of faculty who had prior experience teaching online in order to share their knowledge with colleagues. Soon afterwards, we started a blog called Teach on Dornsife, a place in which faculty could share tips, strategies, information on which were the best platforms and software packages, what worked in class and what didn't, and uh, most importantly, how to keep students engaged and also how to keep everyone upbeat, healthy, and on the path to graduation. The blog has now almost 70 entries, each one a deep and considered look at some aspect of online learning, written from the perspective of one colleague speaking to another. So today, it's my great pleasure to bring together some of the most prolific contributors to that site to have a conversation and share their experience of the revolution in teaching that we're living through, as well as some reflections on the opportunities and challenges presented by virtual learning for students and faculty alike. So let me introduce then five of our most innovative teaching professors. Krista Bancroft, who's an Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Biological Sciences. Amber Foster and Ben Pack, both assistant professors in our writing program. Shannon Gibson, Associate Professor of International Relations and Environmental Studies. And Jessica Parr, an Associate Professor in our chemistry department. So welcome everybody, it's great to have you here and uh, thank you for doing this. So let's begin uh, with Shannon. Think back to March, Shannon, and what were your initial impressions or what was your initial reaction when USC went online? Well, my first reaction was thank goodness. As someone who teaches classes on global public health, I had been fielding some pretty tough questions for two or three weeks from students leading up to us, uh, you know, USC making that decision. So from a public health perspective, I was quite happy and proud to be a part of a university that was a leader in going online early, um, especially at such a critical moment like us going to spring break. Um, I firmly believe that having made that decision then and giving us the testing trial time um, really helped get the faculty on board quickly, uh, as well as prevented potentially massive outbreaks had we had students flee to all corners of the world for a week and then come back. Um, the second thought that went through my head was, I'm so happy I've done this before. Um, having, having used Blackboard and Zoom and some of the other applications that we, we all ended up getting up to speed on, like Slack and things like that, um, I was happy I personally had experience. But I also knew that really quickly it was going to be sort of an all hands on deck moment for students and faculty. And what's been really interesting to see, and I think one of the positive outcomes of this has been watching some of these silos or barriers fall down between students and faculty, faculty and deans, um, between faculty and staff, uh, you know, and, and even across disciplines as we took classes together through the Center for Excellence in Teaching, you know, I've met people in different departments and fields that I probably wouldn't have met otherwise as we collaborated together. So it was a steep learning curve, um, but I think, you know, through these initiatives, such as the blog and other things that we've done, we've, we've ramped up pretty quickly. Yeah, it's been interesting to see the extent to which the faculty have come together to really have a conversation about teaching. Right. So I think we take a lot of that for granted. You know, many of us have done it for years. And so it's not something necessarily in the day to day we teach so we talk so much about. So the ability for us to actually have that conversation, as you say, across departments, and across disciplines, I think has, has been really great. So so the faculty stepped up and kind of adjusted very quickly. 
how did students react? So, so Jessica, you teach chemistry, and that's a very hands-on discipline. You teach a lot of students in the lab. How did students react to going online? So the students were, I think, just as much in crisis mode as the faculty uh, at the moment when we were in it. Um, and uh, I think that they understood why we were going online. And the responses I got from students were positive and they had an expectation that we would do our best to deliver the same uh, education we would have if we were all in the classroom. There were a lot of questions about what the laboratory would look like and what we did in the spring is a little bit different from what we ended up doing in the fall again because we were responding in the moment. Um, and one of the benefits for chemistry is a lot of our physical skills the students already had. And so those weren't things that we needed to make up for and we could design things so that they could do more data analysis and look at things a little bit more in depth than we necessarily would have if we had them doing activities in the lab. Um, and the responses I got from students were all very positive. They could tell that we were trying our best and really working as hard as we could. Uh, we all gave up our own spring breaks to do what we could and free time and weekends. And um, the students, for the most part, really recognized that that was happening. Um, and even now, I've had a couple mid-semester thank yous from students who said, hey, I know how much work you're doing, and I appreciate it. Thanks for keeping us engaged in the classroom. Um, and that, as a faculty member, it's nice to hear, because I can't see their faces as easily. Um, and so getting those emails and responses from them is um, definitely helpful in keeping that communication open. If, if I could add something on here, I would just say that we had such an opportunity to create a sense of continuity and stability for students. Um, and that was really what I saw also in my teaching was my role was that sense of not, it's not going to change. We're still doing what we, what we set out to do, right? The mission is the same. We're just going to change it to make it work better uh, for the online environment. And I, I feel like that was especially helpful um, in helping students manage the stress of it felt like you know everything was um, uh, going really poorly with the COVID crisis at the time, and so there was this sense of like here in class we can have this moment of like reflection and and hanging in there. So I feel like that was something that was really helpful about it was just kind of rolling up our sleeves and saying, okay, we've got this. Yeah, that's great. And so how did your teaching change? What, uh, what kind of um, uh, adaptations, alterations did you notice in your own teaching practice when you were no longer on campus? Well, what's really interesting is that the content of our classes did not change, but the method of delivery was completely transformed. Uh, things that work well in face-to-face -face environments don't work so well on Zoom when the attention span is a little shorter, uh, when there are digital distractions abounding. And so you have to really redesign a course to work well in an online environment. And I think a lot of us had that background in instruction, online instruction, so we had that like distinct advantage of saying, okay, I'm going to use all the tools at my disposal. There's all of these digital tools out there designed to be effective online teachers, and we just need to take advantage of them. So really it was about changing the way we teach so that the online space can be really dynamic and fun for students. Um, whereas where if you were in person, you might those things may not work the same or may not work in the same way. And how about you, Ben? You're also a writing instructor. How did you feel that your teaching changed? I mean, one of the things that I really enjoy about online teaching is that most students are actually working from home. And so they're actually writing and taking class in the environment where they normally write and do work. Um, I love being in a classroom. I love that energy in a class. But none of us go to a classroom to actually write and work. And so I've actually thought a lot about um, using the physical space that students are in um, to think about sort of how they can build practices actually in the environments that they're in. 
So today we actually just did uh, one of my favorite lessons, which is talking about informal invention, which is basically like all those weird, funny things that you do to come up with ideas from, you know, doing push-ups or like I used to lay out M&Ms like on my computer and I'd eat one like every time I finished a sentence. Um, and so students were able to like go in their homes, right? Like and find those things and test out different practices and then actually come back, right? And do some writing and then see, right? Like how they can modify the environment that they're in to actually begin making that work for their writing process. Um, and I've really tried to find sort of different unique ways that we can get students um, not just engaging in the online tools, but also just engaging in the physical environment that they're in and using again that environment to help really improve their learning. Yeah, great. Um, Krista, you had a lot of uh, teaching experience online from other programs that you've taught in in the past. What was new this time round and, and what was constant? What remained the same? So the online class that I taught uh, or have taught for many years was designed to be online. And so the uh, it had this um, library of asynchronous lecture content that students were meant to always were meant to watch on their own time. And then when we met together as uh, a group, it was for synchronous discussion. So it was designed in that way. Um, but even so, uh, those were two hour discussions, uh, which is a long time. And so um, even in something like that, where it's a quote discussion, you have to break it up so that students don't get um, sort of stagnated and staring at the screen. And you, um, I try and break those up into 15 and 20 minute activities and they go to breakout rooms and do a project and come back and report on it. Um, letting everyone have their chance to talk, breaks it up wakes them up. Um, so all those things um, I think are true. And what's interesting, I have a class today, which is a lab um, and it's freshmen and we are doing um, genetic analysis uh, together, um, analyzing a bacteria phage genome. And it's a three hour lab. And, you know, the you know realistically are they really going to sit in uh, zoom for three hours and so i'm letting them be more autonomous with their time um we have a we meet all together and then i will send them to breakout rooms to do work together if they like or i tell them you know listen if you are over it today and you want to meet together as a group over slack um during the week if you want to talk that way then that's okay, you know. Um, and I think they appreciate having some autonomy as opposed to a strict uh, class schedule that we're um, making, forcing them into. And so that's something that is unique about being online and uh, it's giving them a little more freedom. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? And yeah. I, I know that some of us also have kids in, in, in schools as well. You realize when you're in an environment like this, how much education is actually warehousing of various different kinds, right? Of moving people around from one room to another for these sort of slots of time that are very conventional. But actually online has kind of opened up the way in which we sort of have a bit more agency over how we use time in order to learn, right? And it allows you to be a bit more organic about how, how and when you pick things up and do right. discrete tasks. So, exactly. you know, like you were saying, it's, it becomes more outcome based, right? It's not so bound. So the cat by the calendar, the schedule, the clock, it's more as long as you are completing these tasks and producing this work, you know, meaningful assignments that I've set you rather than just busy work or coloring in, right? I'm, you're, you're going to get the same kind of output. So you're going, to, you're going to learn, but you're going to do it in a slightly to a different rhythm than the one we have on campus. Right. Right. And Actually, I, I, yeah, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say that this is like classic adaptive learning. This is the learning that adapts to the pace of the student. And so it actually makes learning way more student centered because the student can learn at their pace. And that often will address some of the inequities we see in higher education, right? This idea that everyone has to learn at the same speed. So by having some activities shift offline and, or onto the what we call asynchronous learning, right? Uh, you have this real opportunity to reach out to students who might learn at a slightly slower pace due to a, like a learning disability. And it gives them this opportunity to do things at their own speed, which I think is also something worth mentioning. 
Yeah, or, you, or even if they're just night owls or people who like to work harder in the morning and then take the afternoon, you know, for themselves or something like that. Um, Chrissy, you mentioned that your lab was three hours. Now, that's really long, okay? And it's <laughs> long for anybody. Um, how do, have all of you managed keeping students engaged? Because we hear a lot about Zoom fatigue, you know, we, we all experience it ourselves from the meetings and the teaching that we're doing. Our students definitely are reporting back. How are you handling that and how are you, have you factored that into um, to the way that you're teaching? So, so who'd like to have a go at that one? Um, Shannon. Yeah, I had this um, this task to deal with over summer because I taught a course that was taught Monday, Wednesday, Friday for two hours and 50 minutes at a time mm -hmm. because it was a very shortened schedule. And so some of the things that I adopted, which I, I believe some of my colleagues have done, are things like the flipped classroom where you do pre-record some asynchronous material that doesn't really require everybody to be in the same room sitting next to each other for. Um, and it does, it gives students much more flexibility so they can, if, if they want to watch one 15 minute lecture here or they want to power through the three 15 minutes then if they want to sit and eat their lunch um, if they're you're multitasking whatever it may be um, it gives them a little bit more flexibility and then I also then took our synchronous time and tried to make it as interactive as possible so one of the things that I did this summer was to do a, a full week so almost almost six hours of a model United Nations simulation. And some of my colleagues thought I was crazy trying to do this with a class of, you know, 25 students all online. And it worked, some students actually said it worked better than the live model UN simulations that they've, that they've done in class because using Blackboard and Zoom and Slack in a way it was more ordered, it was more diplomatic. Um, and it made me flash back to some of the times that I've run them in class and I, I then remembered myself running from like whiteboard to whiteboard to write things down and I'm like frantically getting my TA to go figure out that student's name so we can write down their wonderful contribution. Um, but with these electric, you know, these different applications and tools, it actually made it run quite a bit better. And the other thing was that by setting it around COVID-19, because it was a public health course, um, students were so engaged. Um, they were ready to get involved in the material. They were, you know, they were assigned to work as countries that were renegotiating the international health regulations in light of COVID-19. And some of the responses I got from them were really interesting that by actually addressing these issues, it helped them to maybe remove some of the emotion and fear that comes with talking about what we're all going through. So they could look at the politics, the economics, the facts, not what's on social media <laughs> or elsewhere. And, um, you know, it, it, I think that taking that time to be really, um, to really think through when, when and how you use that synchronous time so that it's incredibly meaningful to them um, really helps them manage, again, all the extra stressors that they have as well. That's great. And um, so, I mean, similarly, um, when we're on campus, our assessments tend to revolve around things like midterm examinations and blue book exams and proctored assessments of various different kinds. Now we've heard a lot about some of the challenges of delivering traditional exams online and I think especially in the natural sciences because I'm an English professor and you know we write an essay you can do that from home you can do that in the library you can do that many places. Um, Jessica how have assignments changed in chemistry and what kind of innovation have you seen there given that people can sit at home and potentially Google answers one imagines. So, so how have you redesigned things? So um, one thing some of us have done, particularly in the freshman classes, is rather than having these big hour-long exams, we're actually having several smaller quizzes throughout so that we're still getting the assessments and the check-ins but um and it's these are still timed but it's lower stakes so it actually relieves some of the stress on the students when they see a 15 point quiz that they have to finish in half an hour versus a 100 point exam they'd have to finish in an hour it just seems so much more reasonable or oh if i screw up this week i've got another one next week it will be okay um so that helped kind of manage the stress of the students, um, but it also means that we can take advantage of things like um, pools of questions. I'm starting to put those together in Blackboard, which physically it's really hard to give students kind of their own exam, but if I put together 
you know, three questions for similarly for question number one, but then it randomizes in Blackboard who gets it. And then the randomizes the order they get it in. Students get almost a unique quiz, even with 150 students. Um, so uh, that's been helpful. I have started taking names off of things. So if I want them to use an acid, I don't tell them what acid it is. I just give them the relevant information. So it's harder to Google the answer for that. Um, are some ways that we've been trying to minimize that. But it's also a time to recognize that so much of that information is available so easily now. So what is it that we want to assess and what is it that we want to teach? So that's been a lot of what I'm reflecting on. Um, and so I'm shifting focus to also what I'm calling data analysis assignments. And so I give them actual data and I give them a little bit more time, usually about four days that they have to work on it. Um, it shouldn't take them more than an hour if they actually sit down and do it in one sitting, but I just want to make sure I give them space to complete it when they can. And um, those really, I think, challenge them to think a little more in depth into what's actually happening than just wrote repeating things that they heard in the lecture. It's taking what we talked about in lecture or what they saw and applying that outside. Um, so that's one thing that I'm doing and on my assignments I'm also having them put together things like infographics which they'll upload that describe different changes and so things that are a little more fun for them hopefully some of them are a little bit overwhelmed they're worried they're gonna be graded on creativity or they have to buy a certain program I'm like no you can dry out by hand and upload it as long as I can read it that's all that matters but um, it's been nice for me to kind of play around with things and see. And I'm not sure I'll necessarily go back to the big hour exams, you know, three or four times a semester with a big final exam, because I'm not sure how much that was actually telling us about our students anyway, so. I think that's really interesting. I think what it's done is it has really forced to the issue of something that I think we all really knew and acknowledged, which is that in the digital age, all of this information is available. And so, you know, you can outsource your memory to, um, to the cloud and, you know, but what you, what that doesn't help you with is critical thinking and application and sort of creative synthesis of forms of knowledge. And so I think you're absolutely right. Assessments that really look to try and find ways to get students to engage in those habits of mind, I think are a lot more valuable. Um, so Krista, you in, in biological sciences, and obviously, you know, there are, there are many different flavors of biology. It's a huge major, especially for pre-meds. There's always been a kind of culture of high stakes exams. How have you and some of your colleagues adapted to, um, to assessing in this new environment? I, there is um, sort of a range um, of over the department, of course. Um, I personally have, my exams have always been fairly application-based. Um, I'm still doing um, fairly traditional exams um, online, but again, uh, my exams have uh, always been application-based and data analysis. I teach upper classmen, so that's really what we're getting at at that point is really um, bringing together all their knowledge and then applying it. Uh, and so, you know, even if I were to do, um, a, you know, an open book exam, it honestly wouldn't help them that much because they're not going to be able to find the answer by looking it up in the book. You know, they they have it would take far too long. The exams are still timed, and so they have to be ready to to analyze um, this particular scientific circumstance. And I think most of our classes are aimed that way anyway. Um, in that they we really strayed from the memorization side of things, even in the freshman courses to where it is application based. So it's really uh, testing their ability to synthesize the information and then answer a question on it rather than memorizing something off slides and, and spitting it back. So that I think is, that actually I think has been consistent, um, but it goes along well with these tests where you have this fear of them cheating and Googling things because you can't really do that. Yeah. So what about in writing instruction? So Ben, have you, I mean, is it the same as it was? You just ask people to email you a paper or has the new medium uh, changed things for you? 
I mean, I definitely think I've gotten a lot better at online course management. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I like about teaching a small seminar is that it can be really flexible. And actually, usually on the first day, I tell students that my primary goal is to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Because if I can't learn from them, then I can't teach them effectively. Because the writing process is so unique to so many individuals. And even though I've been teaching for 10 years, I've never taught like this particular group of students. So that means that like my schedule oftentimes, you know, evolves depending on what the students issues are and the areas that I feel like they need to focus more on. In the past, I always gave paper assignments because that was sort of our rule in our department. But that makes updating the calendar very difficult, actually, because it's a constant series of handouts and emails. And even something just as simple as a Google Doc that has our calendar on it, where I can just add information and I can be like, hey, like this is what I said we were going to cover this day. Here's what we actually talked about this day. Because sometimes we'll start on a great conversation or a discussion and we don't get to necessarily all of the material. It's made managing and delivering that material a lot easier too. I don't get any of those emails anymore that are like, what did we cover this day? When can I come to office hours? It's just, it lives on uh, the Google Doc. It lives on the cloud recording of the classroom. So going back to what Amber was saying, I think it does actually create a lot of opportunities for equity. Um, when students are sick or they have something come up in terms of a family emergency, mental health crisis, or they just have jobs um, that they have to hold on to. I had a student over the summer just, you know, he had a job that he needed uh, to pay rent. Um, and sometimes they were gonna call him in during our class. That would have been a huge problem, I think, in a physical room, but definitely like the online course management makes sort of like all of those other things a lot easier. And then everything else, the writing is, is still very much the same. I think I've upped my PowerPoint game a lot. <laughs> um, my, my PowerPoints used to be like pretty text heavy, and now they're almost all images uh, to keep sort of people's attention. Uh, but other than that, you know, many of the activities we do in class, we're still doing, um, we just do them online now. Yeah. I like to do a little bit of what like Shannon was talking about in terms of having that flipped classroom model where a lot of the nuts and bolts of teaching writing becomes like asynchronous, an offline thing that students can do at their own pace. And so I often tell my students that our Zoom sessions are a writing lab. And so what we do in the writing lab is we are talking about important issues. We're working together. We're writing together. We're collaborating. Uh, so it really makes the classroom time a lot more dynamic and a lot more fun because here you've learned something before class today. So now let's put it into practice. Let's do it now. And I think that really, really helps to keep the Zoom sessions feeling fresh, feeling fun. Um, in a way that I couldn't have done necessarily in face-to-face -face instruction because you usually have some content that you need to deliver, some important thing you need to teach, which now you can do um, on the website. So I feel like that has actually enriched the way that I'm teaching and I may even use some of these videos and, and materials I've created when I go back to face-to-face -to -face instruction. I think in terms That's of very culture, like in terms of campus culture, Mm -hmm. I think it also really helps to have these dynamic classrooms because when students are all here together, like most of their interactions are not in a classroom. They're in their dorm or in the dining hall. But now most of our students' interactions with other students are actually in, in class, right? And so I think that that can create a dynamism in terms of small groups and in terms of partner work where students are really invested um, not just in learning, but also in the campus culture, right? And, and getting to work with other people and building those strong relationships, which I think are also really crucial to people's career development um, and also just sense of self and sort of what they want to uh, learn more about. Yeah. Yeah, it is really interesting the extent to which there have been a lot of kind of uh, student generated opportunities for conversation and interaction because it's very clear that students, you know, really miss and pine for that interaction that they get on, on the physical campus. But they're doing a lot of things, you know, they're setting up, um, uh, you know, text messaging uh, threads, you know, they're, they're meeting on different servers and different, these different platforms to converse. 
Um, and you're right, it really is putting them in the position of having to make these opportunities to converse. And a lot of them are happening outside of kind of professor constructed spaces, right? Because um, the, the students feel more comfortable when they do it themselves. So it's, it, it is really kind of interesting in the way that it has definitely encouraged that kind of autonomy, which just part of the, the maturation that we expect to take place on campus, right? Th these students are not gonna find themselves behind in that. They're gonna find that they've actually developed some new skills that perhaps they weren't anticipating, which I, I think is really interesting. I think when we reflect back, we'll be able to understand that with a bit more clarity. But that leads me on to my next question, and I was gonna ask um, this of Shannon. So. What, um, what new skills and um, aspects of learning have you found have been really emphasized by the online environment that perhaps are not so foregrounded when we're on campus? I think one of the things that has become very apparent is the need for students to guide their own education, um, to do that autonomous work, because now I'm not in front of the class, I'm not in front of them two to three times to say, hey, don't forget your quiz is next week, or check your syllabus for your readings. Um, some of those verbal cues that we often get, give to help students who maybe don't keep their syllabus with them all the time or bring their books with them to class. Um, so I think that there has been put, there, there's a little bit more um, responsibility put on them to be, to take ownership in their own education. I think also speaking to some things that Jessica and others referred to that with the shift of assignments going from things like memorization, recall, that we've really got more of a focus on sort of higher order learning and really testing those higher cognitive skills. So we're looking at synthesis, analysis, critical thinking, opinion writing, persuasive writing, those sorts of tasks um, as part of one kind of a knee jerk reaction to wanting to maintain our academic rigor and avoid cheating, but also a recognition of things that we've been discussing for years about the fact that that's what college should be about to begin with, right? Um, that this isn't middle and high school, that we should be testing things that have to do with their own problem solving skills, not their Googling skills. And then I think a final thing that I've seen that we've, we've seen a lot of focus on is just the building of resilience. Um, for students to be able to cope not only with their educational challenges, but what happens when real life interferes with their education. Um, I was talking with some students about this the other day, you know that people have issues with their jobs, dependent care, um, their families, their living situations, but we still have to keep sort of soldiering on. So then what are the coping mechanisms and skills that they can adopt to deal with getting through their degree that they can also be applied to their own life and other challenges that they'll confront once they leave USC. So I think we're, you know, we're at a place where we're really training students to become better prepared outside of the university. Shannon, I sometimes joke with my students that I'm teaching them not just writing, but also time management. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me in my position of, um, as Dean of Undergraduate Education is that every year we prepare an emergency plan, right? And that emergency plan sort of sits in a drawer and we hope we never use it. And, um, uh, you know, it includes extensive um, steps on how to move the instruction online. But of course, the emergency we plan for being Southern California is an earthquake, right? And we, in our emergency plan, we make a commitment that um, all instruction will resume online within 10 days of a, of a major earthquake incident. And we managed to do it in three days, which I think is pretty impressive. And nobody saw this coming whatsoever. But it is true. If you're, if you're a Trojan, you, that could happen, right? We have that plan. It's in the drawer that we could move online at any moment. So, you know, fingers crossed that won't happen, obviously. But the, um, but there is this sense that, uh, you know, you do have to adapt. You always will have to adapt. You never know what's going to happen. And, um, you know, be prepared is a really important thing. So, um, okay, you've, you've all, we've all been doing this for about six months or so. You must have seen some great examples um, in your classes of uh, student work or projects or innovative things that really kind of you that struck you as cool. So um, who'd like to share? So Ben, how about you? What have you seen? Yeah, if you give me screen sharing abilities, I can actually show you one of the things my students did. Um, 
something I haven't talked about yet is the class I teach is actually an experiential writing course uh, where students partner with different community partners. So we work with former prisoners, uh, people experiencing homelessness, um, as well as local high school students on their writing. And one of the projects that I was really impressed by students uh, last semester was they created this uh, social distance scene. So they got uh, solicited articles from uh, members of the Francisco Holmes Writing Workshop, which is former prisoners. And then they also um, wrote entries themselves. Um, they even got uh, solicited one from myself as well, uh, right there. Um, and then they helped uh, the uh, different participants um, design and collage uh, these different collections together. Uh, we then distributed that zine um, to the Francisco Homes uh, so that residents could see how other residents uh, were uh, addressing and dealing with uh, the pandemic as well as the USC students. So I thought it was a, a great example of how students took an opportunity to sort of like reach out in digital ways and actually still build community uh, with our different partners. I think another really great example of that is the organization Miracle Messages that I work with, which during a normal time, what we do is we help people experiencing homelessness reconnect back to lost loved ones and family members. What happened during the pandemic is that many cities started housing people that were homeless in hotels. Um, but of course, that's a very isolating place. You're not in your usual um, area. You don't know the people around you. And so that whole organization actually pivoted and created a program called Miracle Friends uh, that provides social support to people living in hotels, uh, where a volunteer will call them uh, on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis and just chat with them and find out how they're going, how things are going and communicate to the social workers about what that person is experiencing. And it's turned into some really amazing friendships. Um, a lot of my students have actually continued to do that from the spring and they're starting to do that in the fall as well. Um, and it's amazing how students are able to find equity and reciprocity in those relationships. I think one of my favorite stories uh, is just one of my students uh, was learning Spanish and so her friend speaks Spanish and so they uh, converse in Spanish over the phone together and she gets to practice her Spanish and he gets to have conversations with her and they get to talk about their lives. He's like probably in his late 70s. She's in her early 20s. It's not the kind of like friendship that you would normally expect. Um, and yet I think it's been really impactful and meaningful to both of them. And again, that's something that wouldn't have happened necessarily uh, without the pandemic and going online. Yeah, that's great. How about um, anybody else? Uh share something that surprised you uh, or uh, you found really really fun or engaging I will I'll share well in in the spring I was teaching my um, GE seminar uh, w which was on William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe to um, Elizabethan playwrights and um, just before the pandemic hit I'd split them into two acting companies and they were both going to perform versions of Richard II and Dr Faustus so then you know it happens and uh, they they'd rehearsed and prepared and they'd edited scripts and gone through that process um, so you know we toughed it out we we did we did the performances we did them online they used very inventive zoom backgrounds they used costumes and props from their houses um, they um, rehearsed online performed online and it was fantastic I it was so fun um, there was actually some really good acting, which is kind of amazing because, you know, they were just exactly like I am now, just sort of framed in the square. Um, and everybody just kind of followed through, I think, with a real, and you've, you know, you guys have addressed this already, you know, that real commitment to want to sort of build community in this platform because, you know, the world outside is falling apart and at least we have USC and we have our classroom and we have our classmates and, you know, we can push on through. So that was, that was really great. And I, you know, I was, um, I was deeply appreciative of those students for the commitment and the, um, uh, the ingenuity they demonstrated, but also their maturity, right? Their ability to say, yeah, you know, we've, we've kind of signed up for this. We're, we're, we're in this, we're not going to bail, right? We're going to do it and we're going to do it well. So, so I was really touched by that. And of course, you know, I, I hear about a lot of faculty doing really wonderful things, um, you know, across the disciplines, um, 
you know, one of the things I wanted to ask our scientists was about the labs. I know you talked a little bit about virtual labs. I know that in the physics department, which is much more of a kind of applied physical science, um, they've actually been mailing kits out, lab kits to their students so that they can actually perform the experiments you know, in their home. I mean, Lord help us, let's hope everybody, nobody blows the house up. But, you know, this is, um, you know, really a really interesting way of maintaining that tactility. Now, in chemistry and in biological sciences, you've gone for virtual labs. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about, about that and how that's working out for you. And maybe Jessica, we could start with you. Um, sure. We started exploring, we went through a lot of things. Um, we looked at sending kits, uh, to students. Um, one thing we found was we couldn't get a promise that the international students would be able to get them in time. And so that was one reason why we decided not to go with kits and also our volume uh, as we were trying to make our decision uh, started to become a problem for some of the companies that we were talking to who prepare these kits. Um, and so we decided to go virtual. Um, and so we actually this also fostered some communication between chemistry and biology, which should have been happening a long time ago since we share so many students. Um, but we have two programs that are being used within chemistry and one we share with um, biology. So I'll talk about Beyond Labs, which is one that we were pushing for as uh, chemists and Krista's using um, Labster a little bit more. But Beyond Labs, one reason why chemistry was drawn to it is it's designed by a chemist out of um, BYU. And what he did is he was trying to develop a space where students could play safely. And what's great is he's been working on this for 20 something years. He sent graduate students in their job as TAs in the class was to go in and figure out what are all of these results going to be. So when students combine things together, it's what would actually happen in the lab. They have pictures, they have data, they get to use a little balance and scoop stuff up and put it on. This space that they're provided looks very similar actually a little bit worse than our space. So when they do come into our labs, they'll be like, oh, this is really nice compared to what we saw in Beyond it's Labs. so clean and neat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so we, uh, if something would explode, it explodes. Or if, you know, there's nothing that, you know, it's, it requires a little more guidance um, for the students. So there has been a lot of, you know, step by step, do this, but then I'll ask them to do kind of a little bit more outside of that. Um, and students seem to have responded well to it um, and it's we can replace some things right so we can't get them to physically move things but we can get them to do some things as a interaction they can take a lot of the data um, in a real-time environment instead of us just giving them something to work with all of the time and so we found that it's a it's not a replacement um, and we're talking about you know how we will replace some of those physical skills when everybody gets back on campus but it is um, a fairly good substitute and something we actually think might be helpful for pre-lab experiences before they come in or as a post lab right so you did this one thing in person now go try this at home right so you could perhaps use it to supplement the physical experience just to really consolidate the learning that, that goes on. And that's, that's a good idea. And, and how about you, Krista? So you use the other package. We did. That's called um, Labster. And it is a virtual lab that um, the, it's sort of a 3D environment that the students are in and uh, they navigate their way through a virtual lab. Uh, what we liked about that, we looked at Beyond Labs with chemistry. Um, Beyond Labs is a little more chemistry oriented. It didn't have as many uh, biology uh, applications. So that's why we chose the other. Uh, what we liked about uh, Labster is that it is very student directed in terms of setting up the experiments. So it isn't, uh, when we were online in the spring, we had them watch um, Oh, YouTube videos of labs being done, techniques and things like that, and that was okay in um, the interim. But in these uh, Labster labs, they actually direct the experiment. So they decide how much to add of what um, uh, solution they 
to um, set up the controls for the experiment. So it really requires them to design the experiment. And that's, that was important to us in terms of scientific thinking. Um, and that's half of what we teach in lab. I mean, we like them to handle the instruments and, and learn how to do the techniques, but a lot of it is the thought process behind how you set up and test an experiment. And so the Labster really has that. Um, one thing I like about it, I teach a biotechnology class and which has a lab and we're actually able to have them do labs that we couldn't do at USC simply because they're so um, complex that you couldn't set those up in an instructional lab. You wouldn't have the reagents, you wouldn't have the equipment in an instructional lab. So they are actually able to do some lab techniques that we couldn't do in person. So that's kind of neat too. And something that potentially we could keep uh, when we go back to in person is uh, do some of the virtual labs that have these um, uh, ex equipment that we don't have for students. Um, so marrying the two could be a good option in the future too. Yeah, that's great. And I think it's important to, to note something that you alluded to that, um, you know, maybe our, our alums, parents and friends of Dawnsight will want to hear, which is that those students who have not been um, exposed to the practical hands-on skills yet we'll get an opportunity to catch up on that and that we're really training and trying to keeping them engaged in the scientific thinking uh, through the remote medium and then Absolutely. when we're on you know we can we can learn it too so that's important. yeah and actually we're thinking about that if potentially um, we can do something in the spring or whenever is do sort of um, uh, crash courses in lab right. techniques mm -hmm. that we really want mm -hmm. them that maybe they missed uh, last semester we want to expose them to have signups and come in for three hours and learn mm -hmm. this in sort of an mm -hmm. ad hoc way but to make mm -hmm. sure they do catch up yeah that's great yeah, we're right, calling we can... ours boot camps but same thing boot, so, yeah. same yeah <laughs> So we, we've been very upbeat. We've been talking about all of the, you know, the sort of good, uh, the good things that have been happening, the very positive things that have been happening. You know, it would, in the interest of balance and, and being completely fair, we have to admit that there have been challenges too, and not everything has gone well. So what are some of the challenges you have faced and uh, what do you think some of the, some of the, the most difficult pieces of this uh, particular moment in time have been? So. So who'd like to start? Shannon. Yeah, I think one thing that in talking to colleagues and friends, our biggest challenge is how to get them to show up and how to get them to have cameras on sometimes. And of course, there are certain circumstances where completely understandable that students can't have cameras on and things like that. Um, but again, balancing that academic rigor and flexibility, but not so much to the, to the point that we are all isolationist learning. Right, and the fact that we still do need interaction between the faculty and the students, between the students and each other, some of the things that Ben was talking about, right? For their own mental health and well being, they need to talk to one another, they need to discuss what's going on in the world. Um, and so I think some of those challenges I've uh, I was very pleased over the summer with my class where I consistently had all 26 of my students in class, cameras on, participating. If they couldn't have cameras on, you know, they were messaging in the chat or sending in emails. Um, and kind of two ways I, I attempted to increase their participation was first by explaining that when we can see each other, it helps me as a, as a faculty member, as a professor. Um, if I can see that you look confused, or bored or you're writing so hard it looks like your arm is going to fall off right like those are cues that we need to be effective instructors to know if we need to slow down or take time for questions um, so it benefits them um, if they can if they can be an active part of class for us to, to better you know teach and then I think the other thing um, I, I mentioned before I teach a class on global public health but I also teach classes on social movements and global climate change. So these aren't exactly static courses. Um, I'm fairly certain most of the videos I filmed on COVID-19 over the summer, I'm probably going to have to refilm in you know a couple of months. Um, but one thing I've tried to explain to them that even though there is this push and this discussion about the well, what happens when we come back? Like, will we all still be doing online education because we've proven that it can work? 
And one of the things that I say is like the, the end goal is to be in class. It's to be in front of one another and, and to have these dynamic discussions and the hard debates. Because the fact is we can't address things like racial and social equity, Black Lives Matter, climate change, COVID-19 by doing the work on your own, right? Like you can't address those issues by watching the video by yourself, um, by turning off your screen, by just writing up the assignment and sending it to turn it in, like to address the real world issues that we're all grappling with that put us in this place to begin with, we're gonna have to have face-to-face -face, you know, discussions and, and conversations. So I think that by emphasizing some of those things, it's, it's helped to get them more on board to not wanting to just kind of slip into the, send me the link, let me watch the video and give you my assignment and um, please my grade <laughs> after that. Um, so that's been one challenge and one way that I've addressed it. I would um, add on there, Shannon, that, you know, the things that I thought were going to be challenges before in the spring, before we shifted, I was like so worried, you know, like, oh my gosh, are they going to participate? Are they going to have their screens on? Am I going to be able to build community? Am I going to keep them, you know, in? Those things actually didn't turn out to be a problem. And so it was, I was really surprised. Like now every day when I log into class, um, I would say almost every single one of my students has their video on. Um, and and so the, th the they are talking to each other they're working in groups so I feel like those things haven't turned out to be as big of a, a challenge as I thought they would be and whereas other things turned out to be more challenging like the pacing of a class right like things that you could accomplish in 50 minutes in a, in a in-person classroom you can't really do the same in a in an online classroom like it takes longer to sort of get people into groups it takes longer to share screens for a digital presentations and so all of that you, I found that was actually the most challenging thing of just on a nuts and bolts level of teaching in the first couple of weeks was like getting that sense of like flow between activities and making it feel seamless to the student in their experience was was a big challenge for me it is funny isn't it because you know I mean you know you get habituated to standing in front of class and talking and you know, then asking a question at some random time in the middle of one's monologue. Um, but this really not only um, makes you focus way more on interactivity, but you're also running the technology. So you're, you're like a sort of TV producer and you're doing a live show, you know, you're always fiddling with something to make sure the setting's right and you've queued up the next thing. So it, it, it really does require, you know, this kind of, you know, 360 vision to be able to keep all the pieces running and to, um, you know, prevent dead air creeping in or these eggy moments where nothing's really happening. So I felt, you know, I found that a challenge, you know, cause you know, just hold on students, wait while granddad fusses around and tries to find the right button to press you know there's a bit there's always a bit of that um so amber you you wrote a couple of pieces on the blog about sort of um you know sort of work-life balance and uh, and stress management and things like that so sort of what what sort of advice um are you giving students about how to sort of manage their workload and the stress of this of this moment I think one of the first things I do is that I am really open with my students is that I'm going through the same challenges, you know, that I, I for example, you know, I've had technological problems and I, I was evacuated because of the Northern California wildfires. And so like I had uh, a failure of work-life balance happening, right, where life intercedes in my ability to teach. And so I am so empathetic of the things that they are going through in their lives as well. And so I think part of it is establishing, okay, we're all in this together and how can we help each other to get through this successfully? So I really try to make an effort to always check in with every student. And, and this is obviously, a, I'm able to do this because I teach small classes, but I check in with them. I make sure they're not just doing okay in the class, but that they're doing okay as a human being, as a person. Um, I try to make sure my students know that I care about them as people and not just as like, did you turn in your assignment kind of thing. Um, and then we brought up a lot this issue of community building, right? And I think it's really, really helpful to get students talking to each other. Um, I'm teaching freshmen right now. They, they feel like when they first came in, they were missing out on that college experience of getting to know people. So I really tried to do a lot of like, okay, now check in with a buddy, see how they're doing 
doing today? Just say hi, you know? And, and, and I do a lot of uh, free writing where students get a chance to just check in with themselves to self-reflect on how they're feeling about the the current situation uh, what would help them to be more successful what goals do you have for the rest of the semester those sorts of things i think taking those pauses um, to reflect can also be super helpful and in my classes i do a lot of group work and so that helps build that sense of community. So um, for my most recent writing project, I had students interview each other for uh, a critical ethnography, studying culture. So I think it was really fun. They got a chance to really get to know a classmate. And then I try to encourage them to work together outside of class, to hang out together uh, on whatever social media platform the kids are using now. So um, and. And my last thing I'll say is that it's important that we also connect students with USC resources like Mindful USC and let them know that there are apps, there are online services that they can go and connect and do mindfulness activities and do stress relief activities, right? That those resources are out there. And sometimes students, when they first come into USC, they don't always know that those resources are there. And so we can, with our Blackboard pages, promote different things that they can do, meditation groups and things that may help them to balance, you know, during this like really <laughs> stressful time. And it is, I mean, all of the resources of USC that, uh, that um, you know, come as a package when you're a member of the community, you know, all of those are still going. And so there is an enormous amount of resources, but it is a bewildering amount of resources too. So I do think the faculty play a special role in sort of helping to curate that and, and uh, connect students to the, to the various services we have. Okay, we're going to wrap up in a minute, but I just want to ask you all one final question and get you all to, um, to give me your thoughts on this. Now, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will return to campus. This COVID moment will be over. We can cleanse our minds a bit and move forward. What aspects of your remote teaching, your teaching online, do you think you might carry forward? What, if any, or will you just completely revert to how you used to teach before? So Jessica, how, what are you gonna carry forward into the future? Well, I'm definitely gonna reevaluate my assessments um, mm -hmm. and what I'm doing for that and the assignments. However, I had spent over a year and a half preparing a much more engaged active environment. So I will be reverting to that where students get to do a lot more hands-on in the lab space, which I spent a lot of Fridays over the summer actually recording the experiments they would have done without any narration. And then I show them live through a YouTube video and tell them what we were doing. So sort of replicating that um, in person uh, or online as best as I can. So I think reevaluating assessments, um, I wanna do a lot more with um, case studies, which I haven't had a chance to do, but now kind of got the kick in the pants to work on that because now I have to do things that are more exciting um, in the online environment. So those are, I think, what I'll be keeping from the online. Ben, how about you? Well, again, I work a lot with community partners and so their worlds like have changed a lot um, and mm -hmm. their needs are really different now as well. And so when I think about coming back to campus, right, it's not just our students, right? It's also students at LAUSD that my students are working with and like, mm -hmm. you know, the challenges that they're experiencing. So I really think that it's driven home the importance of engagement and dialogue and really listening to sort of what the other side has to say. Mm -hmm. I don't really anticipate that we'll go back to like what things look like in mid-February of 2020, mm -hmm. um, but I am excited right about the opportunities um, and the changes because I think it's just created all these new points of contact that we've built upon the existing relationships that we've had. And again, I think that just provides more opportunities for students to create engagement and find ways to stay involved in the communities. One of the sort of silver linings, I think, out of that community engagement shift to online is that uh, residents that had moved away, for example, or people that were no longer parts of programs could like digitally dial in and they could actually stay parts of the community. Um, we no longer have to worry about like the number of chairs that are around the living room table, you know, like in our writing workshop, um, we can actually invite um, students and 
um, beyond sort of like our normal cap. And actually we've had students come back uh, to writing workshop uh, with our former prisoners from the spring semester. So my hope is that we'll continue to sort of like use those online tools just to foster greater engagement with um, really the communities that surround USC and really I think at least in my practice are really integral to USC and uh, working with sort of the environment that we have. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Amber, same question for you. Well, like Ben, I've also been sort of taking advantage of this uh, situation to advance the way that I teach and to evolve as a teacher. So I would say I've been doing a lot with uh, improving students' digital literacy, um, using um, technological tools in, in writing, writing for digital audiences. And so all of those things are things that I'm totally going to be using moving forward because we're increasingly living in this digital world. And so students need to be able to do those things. And I think this situation kind of lit a fire in me to really start tackling um, how, how we learn in digital context. So these are things that are very interesting to me. And I also think that this current crisis made me think more about accessibility and how students learn and how students learn at a different pace. And it's something that I want to continue to work on, you know, and, and really thinking about how digital tools and technologies can help students to actually learn more effectively, whether they're face to face or online. So all of that is like got a lot of I'm excited about exploring lot, as I move forward. Yeah, Krista. Mm -hmm. um, so in even when we were on campus, um, years a year ago um, or half a year ago I did a lot of asynchronous um, material teaching and uh, did a lot of in-class active learning so that was my model um, even when we were in person so I will I will keep that and I've kept that online it just looks a little bit differently so um, those things I will continue um, I like to go off of what Amber's saying and what I was talking about before that um, having a little more autonomy in in how students want to manage their time um, I think I will keep because um, you know allowing more flexibility in in when they might complete an assignment over a week or um, how they want to work with a partner whether it be in class or out of class and those things I think um, allowing students more flexibility and um, giving them independence I think is uh, a useful tool and so I think I will keep some of those ideas too. Great, thank you. And, and finally, Shannon. I think what I will take away isn't so much, you know, the applications or the assignments or the, mm -hmm. the pre-recorded videos. It's really fundamentally changed how I approach the classroom and students. Um, prior to this, I think a lot of us had this sort of transactional type of interaction with our students in the class where we, the holders of knowledge, come in and disseminate knowledge, and then they do assignments and give it to us, and then we give grades. Um, and it wasn't very, not, not, enough, not all the time, but you know, it wasn't maybe sometimes the most humanizing process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as we've gotten into, you know, gone through this year together and, and speaking to some of the things that Amber was talking about, have had to be empathetic to one another and understand that everybody comes from different walks of life with different challenges and different um, barriers to overcome that we've really broken down some of those barriers between faculty and students. And so one of the things that I, I will take away is learning not so much how or attempting to be just the instructor that's delivering information, but also to think about how I can be more of a support to my students, to think beyond just the grades and the assignments and, and is this, you know, is this excuse validated or true or are they trying to pull one over on me, but thinking about um, you know, how we support students in the classroom, the future, you know, in their career and getting internships and things like that. And one of the quotes that's kind of stuck with me that I heard, I believe it was an academic Senate meeting like a year or two ago, um, where someone said that, you know, as faculty, we aren't therapists, but we certainly need to be therapeutic. And so I think that has been something that moving forward that I will try to embrace that we don't have to, um, be this understanding or be flexible or work with individual students as challenges just because we're in a pandemic that that should be our constant so i think i have a that's really shifted my way of thinking about those those classroom interactions and a renewed appreciation for that which is great 
Well, that was wonderful. I mean, I t- I t- in this um, period of quarantine and lockdown, the lease has run out of my car on my car and I've broken my glasses. So I'm looking forward to a cool new ride and some new frames, a new look. So when I return to campus, you won't recognize me guys, but I wanna thank you all for taking the time uh, to do this and to have this conversation for everything you do for our students and for really moving along the dialogue um, among faculty about online learning. I'd like to thank all of uh, you for tuning in and watching. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, during this virtual Trojan Family Weekend 2020 event. Have a wonderful rest of your day and of course, as always, fight on. <laughs>